Japan's Washington Journal, live at 7 Eastern Wednesday morning. Join the discussion. Now, a debate on the situation in the Middle East and the policies of the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations. The forum includes author David Horowitz and Bassem Youssef. Mr. Youssef is the author of Revolution for Dummies, Laughing Through the Arab Spring. We'll also hear from former Obama administration officials and former Navy intelligence and counterterrorism officer Malcolm Nance. This is from the Politicon conference held in Pasadena, California. Yep. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Terry McCarthy. I run the World Affairs Council here in Los Angeles. And I'm not getting my microphone working. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Um, so of those 72 events we do every year, a substantial portion are about the Middle East. Um, I hope I don't have to prove tonight that the Middle East is in a mess. I think we can take that as given. But what we do want to look at tonight is how we got here and particularly where we can go forward. Uh, because this is, as we're seeing, is a problem that cannot be contained within the Middle East. It's spreading to Europe and even to our own shores. And so I'm going to start with David Horowitz, who was dubbed by the New York Times as the intellectual godfather of the Trump organization, Trump administration, has written a number of books. Uh, David, you have some strong views about how we got here. Yes. And I'm also hoping you have some strong views about how we get out of where we are. So, floor is yours. I'll, I'll take the first question. Um, <clears throat> first, to look at what we're talking about. In the eight years of the Obama administration, 500,000 people have been slaughtered. Christians, Yazidis, and Muslims have been slaughtered by ISIS and other jihadists in the Middle East in the name of Islam's God. Uh, Libya uh, and Yemen have become uh, terrorist states. Libya and Yemen have become terrorist states. The United States was, when Obama began, was a dominant foreign power in the Middle East. Uh, it's been expelled and uh, replaced by Russia. Uh, which is allied with two monster regimes, Syria uh, and uh, Syria and Iran, of course. Um, and the reason for this is Obama's, what he calls the strategic patience, a, a doctrine of strategic patience, which is really strategic cowardice. Um, he has uh, failed, he drew a red line in Syria. Um, to try to stop Assad, uh, whom actually both his secretaries of state uh, enabled by calling him a democratic reformer. Uh, when he began slaughtering his own people, Obama drew a red line, uh, which he didn't, inf uh, to stop him from using chemical weapons, which he didn't, in didn't enforce. Um, the Obama administration overthrew a completely illegal uh, in immoral aggression in Libya, overthrew uh, Gaddafi, who was a madman, but he was, happened to be at war with al-Qaeda. The result is that Libya is now a, not only a failed state, but a haven for al-Qaeda and ISIS terrorists. Um, the, the, one of the worst things that Obama did was to withdraw American forces from Iraq. We had a base. His, his general said, we need 20,000 troops, um, but Obama had declared, and, and it was his policy, to retreat from the Middle East, uh, and, uh, because he blamed the United States as the problem. Um, into that vacuum, ISIS poured. If there had been 20,000 American troops, ISIS would have been snuffed at birth, and 500,000 people would be alive, and there were also 20 million refugees that were created because of Obama's policies uh, in, in the Middle East. Um, and of course, he overthrew an American ally in uh, Egypt, whereas when the Iranian people revolted in 2009, went into the streets, he was absolutely silent because his policy, his strategy was to embrace America's most mortal enemy, the Iranians. Uh, and he concluded this betrayal uh, of the Iranians by a deal with Iran, of course, of the whole Middle East, by conducting a deal with Iran. By the way, I'm one of five people on this panel with these views. 
but I want to remind you, these are great. That, uh, keep, keep doing that because I represent uh, the sentiments or reflect generally of 63 million voters, half the country, and of course the, administ the administration in Washington. Let's stick to the Middle East. 36 okay. percent. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about stupid polls. I'm talking about actual votes. You, I mean, who's president, Hillary or Trump? Um, David, David, let's 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 let's. If you want to understand what Trump has been in office six months uh, and put together, as you know, a coalition of Arab states. Uh, in those six months, Mosul has been liberated, which was the chief stronghold of ISIS in Iraq, um, and Raqqa is on the verge of collapse. So those 500,000 people didn't really have to die, and the 20 million didn't have to be sent into exile. This is what happens when the United States abdicates its responsibility. It's the only great power in the world with the means and the will uh, to protect human dignity and human de decency and maintain a peace. And the answer to your second question, which is, what's the path to, to peace? The path is to reassert. Amer it's very hard now because Russia is there and allied with Iran. Uh, and by the way, this, uh, since we have, we have two people on this panel who, who were enablers of these policies, <laughs> sitting to the right of me. I just, I, just, I just love you liberals. 500,000 people slaughtered because of these policies. And you applaud them. Great. Okay, okay. David, thank you for that. You've set a scenario here. Set the tone. Um, yes. Jen? David nailed it. I'm getting the sense that uh, David on. doesn't like Barack Obama. Just okay. call me crazy. Um, You're channeling there. I want you to, uh, I want you to approach something specific. Yeah, David talked about the Trump administration's policy in the Middle East is to assemble a coalition of Arab states. Central to that coalition is Saudi Arabia. Yes. It was the first country he chose to visit. Mm -hmm. Are these good actors? Good question. Um, let me just say one thing, though. One thing David uh, conveniently left out was the Iraq War, which I think we can all agree is a huge driver of unrest and unhappiness with the United States and the growth of extremism. I'll just leave that there. I think we should talk about what's moving forward. So Trump went to Saudi Arabia on his first trip. He was applauded for this by many people. Here's the reason we should be concerned about it. Yes, Saudi Arabia says they are going to fight extremism. On the surface, we should applaud that. Now let's not forget they have been the root cause of some of the extremism and have sat by while some of that has happened. What Trump is also doing is falling into their trap, which is inserting himself in the Sunni Shia division that is all over the Middle East. He, I'm not convinced that he completely understands what that is. Maybe David or somebody else is explaining that to him. But that should be of great concern to us. And we can look at just the fact that he went there and he announced a big package of military aid. That was the big deliverable from his trip. Now, that military package had been in the works since long before Trump took office with one important caveat. He allowed... The, uh, he allowed that military package to insert itself in the civil war in Yemen and helped arm the Saudis with equipment they, they could use to further that conflict. So again, I'm just going to give him the benefit of the doubt because he doesn't seem to be a guy steeped in policy and think maybe he doesn't know that. But there are a lot of dangers to, to look out for, I think. Um, as it relates to Trump's engagement in Saudi Arabia, his interest in being close to the Saudi family, um, his first trip, uh, I think that's cause for some concern. Uh, Malcolm, you're a counter-terror intelligence expert, you appear regularly on NBC. Uh, it looks like the war in Syria is at least toning down a bit. Basically, Assad has won, or at least the rump of the war. Uh, ISIS is limited at least in its caliphate. Uh, Mosul has fallen. Uh, Raqqa is about to fall. But this is not over. I am concerned about the future. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Iraq myself. 
uh, the, one can argue about whether or not the U.S. should have invaded Iraq. Most people probably now think it was a bad idea. But you could also argue, think about whether we should have left in 2011 and, and uh, all the crisis, all the, all the chaos that has ensued. What should be our game plan from now on here? We, 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 we've pushed them back out of Mosul, out of Raqqa. Where should the U.S. be now from the, going forward? Well, I, I think it's fascinating. Does this help? Okay. I think it's fascinating, you know, to hear these various perspectives, certainly David's, uh, because I have a very different perspective than most players in this field. I am a warfighter. I am an intelligence warfighter as well. I'm a field practitioner of the dark arts of keeping you safe and keeping the bad guys wherever bad guys need to go. My back is facing you. I'm you're, you're good. You're good. So that being said, I have 35 years in the Middle East. I live in the Middle East. I've just returned from seven years living in the Middle East with my family. Uh, I speak many dialects of Arabic, and I've been involved in every war and ground combat action since Beirut in 1983. So now that I've put my experience into perspective, I have some things to say about that. One, none of this stuff and all the accusations that fly back and forth from either side, these things don't happen in a vacuum. ISIS did not miraculously appear because Barack Obama was elected president. They are the fifth generation of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda started in 1988 in Peshawar, Pakistan, at the end of the Afghan insurgency war. And it was done in order to stoke the passions of Americans to create a clash of civilizations between bin Laden's bizarre, corrupt, cult version of Islam and the hard, extremist, Islamic phobic Westerners who believed that Islam as a body was the virus. We all know, and certainly I know, I live in the trenches, I have bled with Muslim soldiers, I have had these guys married off, I have bought them goat, okay? And I have seen... Uh, are you suggesting we get married to goats? <laughs> no, but you gotta have the goat for the wedding, man. To do what exactly? All right. Dinner! <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I shot the gun in the air when it was time for the guys to get married. These are important things there. And putting that into perspective of the counterterrorism and intelligence continuum of everything that has happened since 9-11, of which I was also a witness, victim, and rescuer, all right, I know what these people are doing. I have been working this mission since 1988, nonstop. And now my job is to explain it to you. We, ISIS, which is a manifestation of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and nothing more, it manifested itself because the government of Iraq kicked us out of Iraq. We couldn't stay there when they forced us out. They came about through their own sectarian passions. America didn't do it, except for the fact that we invaded Iraq in 2003, right? The problem is being solved. Barack Obama started the solution, which was kinetic on one hand, where we bombed the hell out of them. Everything that you're seeing in Mosul, the bombing of Mosul, the bombing of Raqqa, and the denigration and dissolving of ISIS as a caliphate was eight sustained years of those policies. And then when ISIS manifested itself in 2014, we have carried out 30 plus thousand airstrikes, which allowed the last six months of allowing the Iraqi army to go in, and they are the ones who are bleeding on the ground, who defeated ISIS in their own country. They are the ones who have taken back to Crete, Mosul, and are fighting for Tel Afar. They and the Syrian Kurds are the ones who are going to be fighting for Raqqa. So we can pat ourselves on the back and some people can claim Trump did it. No, the US Air Force and the Iraqi army are doing it. They are bringing about the end to ISIS. In another year, that organization will cease to exist inside of Iraq and Syria. It's Okinawa for them. They will not survive. No one will come out alive, except their wives and their children, which is the next generation of trouble for us. 
Many of them are Americans, Westerners, Germans, French, Algerians, whatever. They have kids, and these kids are living in refugee camps. We've just carried out an action amongst this administration where we cut the funding to the Free Syrian Army, the last vestige of what came from the revolution in Syria, and we essentially just turned Syria, everything west of Raqqa, over to the government of Assad and Russia. Now, those guys we just screwed because we cut the funding, they too will start thinking about the United States as a terrorist target in the future. So what's the solution to all of this? Besides, we have to keep up the kinetic warfare. We have to keep up the intelligence warfare. We do need to cooperate and create coalitions. By the way, I take better claim that Donald Trump is, re is using more of my policies on Syria because he told Time Magazine last year the last book he read was Defeating ISIS, my 544-page manual at the end that said we need a joint Arab coalition to defeat ISIS. Now, that's just me bragging, but I, it had pictures with arrows in the back. So, and the funny thing is, in the last six months, all of those arrows have been implemented. So I know he at least pays attention to the maps. That being said, the one thing that has been missing for decades, I've written three books about it, going after the ideology of the cult of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. They are an apocalyptic cult because they have taken the peaceful religion of 1.6 billion people, corrupted it to believe that they are the executor of God's will to bring about the end of times. And their greatest ally are those people in this country and in the West who say it's the 1.6 billion Muslims that are the problem. No, they are not. I know what the 1.6 billion Muslims want. A 2017 Toyota Corolla. <laughs> what they don't need is to have a small fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of a cult, the fifth cult, by the way, that's existed in Islamic history, and have them equated to people who do not follow the Quran, who pretend like they're Muslims, and who have to rely on guys like me from the intelligence community to come and tell you straight that the guy that is sitting to my right is a Muslim. The special forces soldier that is to my left is a Muslim. And that since 9-11, we have been fighting for the defense of Islam, not just our own defense. Because protecting Islam from this crazy cult is the only way any of us are gonna be defended. So I'm a little offended when I hear people say it's the Muslim world. Because why exactly have I been fighting to these guys to my right and to my left? if, in fact, we were not assisting them. Saudis, by the way, David, are Muslims. The Kuwaitis are Muslims. Everyone that's in this grand alliance we're supposed to have are Muslims. So are they the enemy or are they our allies? And that's what this administration is screwing up. They are making them our enemies and they are facilitating the next generation follow-on of terrorists. Okay. Uh, Halle, I want to turn to you. You're a traumatologist trained in Stanford and other places, and your expertise is in the trauma of torture in particular. And you spend a lot of time in Turkey and around the borders of, of Syria dealing with the human costs of these horrendous wars that we've seen. When these, the Syrian war may be now wrapping up, slowing down, when these conflicts are over, these people don't suddenly get fixed. There are hundreds of thousands of people who are horribly traumatized by what's gone on in these conflicts. What does that mean for the future and how can we handle that humanitarian part of this? And I would point out that there are millions of refugees throughout the Middle East who have not been welcomed by the other Middle Eastern countries. It has been mostly on the West to handle this problem and the Turks, Lebanese, but the rich Arab countries haven't really helped. So, what do we do with these people who have been psychically tortured for years and years? We have 
We have on our hands a global health crisis with transgener transgenerational implications. And, you know, this is... Is it on? Just hold better? it. Better? Okay. We have on our hands a global health crisis with transgenerational implications. Uh, it is no, you know, stranger to the public, you know, the stories of PTSD you hear of war traumatized veterans returning and the amount of trauma, suffering, torture many of these refugees have experienced. A very, re however, a very resilient population at that. I do not want to only define them by that, but in speaking to what you had said earlier, how are they supposed to thrive in resettlement? How are we supposed to wrap the resources and the community needs and all the complex needs that they have if we cannot change our narrative? And it truly starts with that. There's so much that is being done that will continue to be undone by that narrative being re reinforced. That is most likely the, the, the most toxic aspect of what we can do as a community. Religiosity and culture is that protective factor. That's the very thing that got them through the horrors of what they experienced. I mean, imagine, just you know, close your eyes for a second and think. If you had to leave your home, you know, first your house is being bombed and your, your, your house falls apart, your children, you pick up their body, literally, and you're running, trying to corral the rest of your family. Um, so, case in point, we need to change that narrative. There's nothing that we can do in a rehabilitative sense that I think can trump that component. And um, the trauma is being weaponized. The alienation is being weaponized. And just as you said, the induction patterns of traffickers and cults are very similar. And they prey upon traumatized, vulnerable communities. And so again, it is that narrative that reinforces uh, the very thing that we do not want. And it strengthens it. Um, so if I could just plant that seed. So and Malcolm leave talked that there. about the women and the children who survive. Yes. These children, particularly male children, I'm guessing, will be susceptible to the next generation 2.0 or whatever we are, 5.0. How do you deal with that? That is a huge uh, issue. And uh, I would love to be able to answer that concisely. And I'm looking at it from an overarching perspective. But so refugees experience, I mean, you know, they're protracted. They're waiting for years in, in respects to trying to be resettled. And then upon resettlement, being in communities that they're not welcomed, and they have a very short amount of time to meet the standards uh, that are required of them in resettlement, for example, paying back their ticket, having to meet certain criteria, and and uh, for them to thrive is to be welcome and integrated into the communities that they're resettled in. I'm just looking at the US. Europe is another animal in and of itself. And there's, that's one thing that I'm, I think we can do as a public, the, the counter-narrative piece. Uh, because the nitty-gritty, the details, we could sit here all day, you know, from the policies to the therapeutic and medical treatment to, it's a system. You know, they say it, it takes a village to raise a child. It's a systemic approach in rehabilitating any trauma survivor and affording that opportunity. But that is eroded, again, by this narrative. That's a huge impediment to my work, um, from protests to funding being cut to, uh, you know, not wanting them in our communities and uh, the bullying of the children, which in every CVE case I've ever seen where a child has been quote-unquote radicalized domestically or overseas, but specifically domestically, an immense amount of bullying has been present in their pro profile. So the human side of it is that, is just that. It's, I, I can, you know, give you this complex drawn-out argument or I, can, or I can appeal to your humanity and your com compassion. And that, that is crucial. That, that is what I represent, the humanitarian piece. And that is the biggest impediment to our work. I, again, have no one set of concrete examples I can give you. That is, but that's where we need to begin. None of it can thrive without that component. Yeah, and it's so hard to keep that human component in mind when we're looking at figures of 400,000 dead and 6 million refugees. But be very let me get on to the speakers. We go back to you. Sure. Um, Tommy, you were on a staff on the National Security Council under President Obama. He took a huge bet on Iran. And the bet was, if we drop the sanctions, we'll do a nuclear deal, and somehow Iran will normalize. In other words, become a 
respectable and trusted citizen of the, of the world. We're two years into that deal now. How do you think the bet is paying off? Um, first of all, I'll say thank you for having me. Um, I approach these conversations with a lot of humility because I don't think that I'm qualified to answer all these huge questions, but I'll try. Uh, and I have a, a, sh a show called Pod Save the Worlds, which you should all download, where we smart, speak with smart people to try to get them to help me learn. Um, I just want to say, I don't, I don't think that Obama made a bet that if we cut the Iran deal, that Iran would become a good actor. I think we, we made a, a bet that we could use a uh, unrelenting series of sanctions and diplomatic pressure to pressure Iran into a diplomatic solution that took us from a, an instance where when Obama took office, uh, there were concerns from our intelligence community that Iran was weeks or months away from a breakout scenario where they could achieve a nuclear weapon. Um, during the first year of the administration, we disclosed the fact that they had a covert facility uh, that they were using to enrich uh, uranium, which there was, you know, it's buried in the bottom of a mountain made of rock. There's not a lot of peaceful purposes for something like that. Um, so Obama saw this as, you know, an existential threat to Israel, to many of our allies in the region, and an unacceptable uh, scenario for the United States. Uh, and if we got to a place where these sanctions and the diplomatic effort didn't work, he would take military action. Luckily, we didn't have to get to that point. We were able to cut this deal internationally, uh, and Iran shipped out its uh, fissile material. Uh, the IAEA, an international organization with a really boring acronym, comes in and they inspect things, and we can learn about their program, and we can gain intelligence, and we get access to these facilities, and it's working. And the way we know it's working is that the Trump administration has to recertify that program every 90 days to Congress. Um, apparently, he was very pissed off that he had to recertify it, but General McMaster and General Mattis and the intelligence community and all his advisors told him it was the right thing to do, so credit to him, uh, he did it. I would juxtapose where we are with Iran and the threat from their nuclear program with where we are in North Korea, a country where we've had no access no diplomatic overtures, no progress in any way, and they have reportedly up to 40 nuclear weapons. Um, we know they're working on efforts to miniaturize a warhead and put it on the top of an ICBM, and they just launched an ICBM two days ago that apparently could fly far enough to hit Los Angeles or Pasadena or even Washington, D.C. So that is um, an enormously dangerous scenario for us uh, as Americans living in the continental United States, never mind the fact that we have 28,500 U.S. troops sitting in Korea, and we have allies like Japan and South Korea all over. Um, so I think the bet he made to try to resolve our problems diplomatically uh, has paid dividends in Iran. I think there is hope over the long term from some that that can lead to uh, additional um, normalization of, of the relationship, but let's be clear, the Iranians are, are arming the Houthi separatists in Saudi Arabia. They've, they've funded extremist groups like Hezbollah. Uh, they're a generally destabilizing actor in a lot of ways in the Middle East. They aren't exactly, you know, good guys or, you know, say a lot of things rhetorically that are abhorrent um, and threatening to, to our Israeli allies and many others. So, you know, I think what we are lacking in the U.S., I think, is a couple of things. One is patience, um, and one is the ability to view world events uh, through a prism other than the prism of Washington or through the United States. I think it's dangerous when we talk about uh, the Arab Spring or the rise of ISIS or Al-Qaeda as something that was solely manifested through actions taken in Washington. Uh, I think that ignores the fact that there are people and countries uh, who are making their own decisions and, and uh, self-determination is an important thing for them. So that's uh, what I got. Thank you. <laughs> so everybody on this panel tonight is accomplished and distinguished in their own ways. But the most special member, for reasons I'm going to tell you, uh, is Bassem, Bassem Yusuf. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Not only is Bassem called the John Stewart of Egypt, <laughs> which is an achievement, not only is he a cardiac surgeon, it's true, but he was almost late for the panel today because he was coming from the hospital where his wife just gave birth to his son.
Well, you know, so Basim, you know, Muslims and Middle Easterns are always late, except when they're making time bombs. We're very punctual. <laughs> That's, that's our, oh, even that we suck at. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to speak about like uh, who did it. Uh, is it. Was it Bush? Was it Obama? Because I'm just like another Middle Eastern who enjoyed being fucked by every single administration. <laughs> uh, it just like, what, 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 what I think it's just really, uh, what really pisses me off is the hypocrisy when, um, well, I mean, like you, you said an incredible point about like the ideology, and the ideology didn't just start in Bishawar, Pakistan, 1988. It was, it came from somewhere else, and it came 40 years ago from uh, your biggest ally in the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia, from the Wahhabism. And when King Abdullah, when King Ab Abdullah died last year, every single American in office, future, future uh, uh, official, past official, present official, just hurried to his funeral. And uh, we heard uh, Trump dissing Muslims, but he was happy to receive a $110 billion deal from Saudi Arabia. He called Qatar a terrorist state. Two days later, they signed a deal for jet fighters. I don't understand how, uh, what the hell is he doing. Uh, but the, but the, uh, we speak here about Syria and Assad but we totally ignore Yemen. We totally ignore Yemen. It's 2017, people, and there is cholera. Cholera is endemic in Yemen because Saudi is bombing the shit out of this country with the blessing or while, you got, while the administration is looking away because it's fine. It's our allies. And, and this is just like, you know, when you talk about like Muslims, how Muslims are horrible and whatever, and you are the biggest ally with them because they just give you oil. So I find that hypocritical. And so, and I, I want to expand the problem a little bit. We speak about like Islam, this Islam, that. You know what? I'm, I want to just like, it's not about religion. It's about, it's, it's not a, a battle to restore Islam. It's a battle to restore freedom of expression. Our problem in the Middle East that there, like, the, many of the Western administrations, not just America, think that it's a better option to have a military regime because they are secular. They are not. They are not. These are dictatorships who also use religion. Jafar Nimeri in Sudan, when he, when dictatorship was not going for him anymore, he announced Sharia. Sadat in Egypt, 1981, when it was not going, 1980 actually, when he, when he wanted to have unlimited times for re-election, he announced Sharia. Dia al-Haq in Pakistan, 81, he announced Sharia. Even Saddam, even Qaddafi, they use religion. There are people who are fighting for a secular view for Islam. People who are like fighting this extreme um, uh, interpretation of Islam. And you know who are the people putting them in jail? Not the Ayatollah, not just the Ayatollah, not people in, in, in Burqa. They, it's the police and the military of these secular military regimes. So th th the problem is, and, uh, is not about like what kind of ideology you want. It's just like a problem of freedom of expression. And the problem is that the Western uh, administration that time and time again, because each president comes here for four years, two and a half years into the office, he starts re-campaigning. Nobody wants to get their hands wet. Of course, it's, 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 except if you're Donald Trump, he starts campaigning after the first week. But, like, <laughs> but the thing is, nobody wants to get his hands dirty, and it's, it's just the status quo. All right, who's going to just like keep this safe for us? Who's going to keep it stable? And it's just going on and on and on. And that's the biggest thing. So if you want a stable Middle East, it is a secular, free uh, Middle East, and, and the ideology and, the, and the, uh, the interpretation will just come along. That's it. Uh, David, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about Iran. I know what Tommy's views were. You have different views. Just give us a quick sense of where you think the Iran deal is going. Yeah, Iran. <coughs> First, can I just say something? So what I'm to understand is there was... Obama, who ran uh, and uh, proselytized on America, pulling out of Iraq, uh, didn't create a vacuum in Iraq that ISIS and Iran filled. Um, Al-Qaeda, yes, ISIS is a mutation of Al-Qaeda, but Al-Qaeda was defeated in Iraq. And if the United States had 20,000 troops there, 500,000 Muslims, Chris, but primarily Christians and Yazidis, would be alive today. 
Um, so, and and uh, Malcolm, I'm very funny, obviously uh, very knowledgeable, says that uh, we're dealing with a, an apocalyptic cult. Yeah, if you read Pew or the Al Jazeera uh, um, surveys, polls and surveys in the Arab world, you find that somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of Muslims support supported Osama bin Laden, support the holy war against the West. Well, that's between 300 and 600 million people. It's a much bigger problem uh, than Malcolm suggests there. Um, now, when you, you ask me a question. Iran, the Iran deal. Yeah, Iran, I mean, here's a kind I mean, the, the Iranians' regime has killed more Americans than any other country in the world. Thousands. Every wounded warrior you see on television uh, was blown up by an Iranian IED. They have, in the middle of these negotiations, and by the way, there's no enforcement. Uh, the, 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 in the middle of the negotiations with Iran, um, their spiritual leader, I think it was Khomeini, uh, led chants of death to America, and they're chanting death to Israel all the time. The idea that Obama would build his whole Middle East policy, and of course they have a path now to nuclear weapons, and they were isolated, and there were sanctions against them, and it was lifted with no quid pro quo. Iran is responsible in the Middle East. You talk about Yemen. Who's in Yemen? It's Iran. If you drive out, I mean, I mean I'm no big fan of the Saudis, uh, but, you know, that's the situation there. The, the, the Houthis are supported by, the, by Iran. Uh, Iran is, uh, I mean, it, it, it's allied with Russia and Syria. That's who, who But what was fighting. the alternative, David? If you had done nothing, they would have got a nuclear bomb? Well, in. I think that Obama invited by pretending that America was the problem, from, from the first, he got in office, he went to the Middle East, he apologized for America and so forth. He made it very clear that we were not going to put troops on the ground, that we were not, we were not going to exert influence, except when it came to overthrowing American allies like Mubarak in Egypt. And by the way, in Egypt, <laughs> well, and he supported the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the fountainhead of the jihad against the West. The Muslim Brotherhood, spawned al-Qaeda, it's where Osama bin Laden learned his, his jihadism, uh, and spawned Hamas. And Malcolm's on record as saying, uh, well, we are, the, the ISIS is, is a monster, uh, an apocalyptic cult, but we can negotiate with Hamas, which in its charters calls for the extermination of the Jews. They're Nazis. And I don't, you know, if, if you read what I've read, I've always said that the majority of Muslims are peace-loving people. This Islamophobia crap, which was invented, happened to be invented by the Muslim Brotherhood to silence critics, has shut the thinking processes of people on the left. Come on, there's a big problem. Uh, you know, I can go on about it. I mean, I have the surveys here me, about Egypt. Basim, you were uh, called I, out there. <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, I, I just like, when I read the numbers, oh I mean, 5,000 Christians and Yazidis killed, that's horrible. I mean, like, how many people did they, had, were killed in the Iraq war that because of the interference of Americans? A bit like a what? Like a half, a half a million? I don't know. Like, I mean, half a million and maybe a million because of the sanctions. I mean, are we going, like, if you're going to go into tallies, I mean, a lot of people were killed because of the American That's interventions in Iraq. About, like, Obama, like, supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm not, a, I mean, I'm, I'm like the nemesis of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. But I can tell you that this exact lie was actually created in our own media, picked up by Alex Jones, then returned again to our media as a proof that... All of, all of that thing about like Obama being the co-founder of ISIS or he's a secret Muslim, it started in Egypt. Minute, and gonna... we are very happy to announce that we started as the cradle of civilization, now becoming the cradle of the end of civilization. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's just like, I mean, I, 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 you're saying because like people in Iran are chanting death to America, death to Israel. You know also who chants that in their streets? Pakistan. 
I will, and they are the receiver of the biggest, one of the biggest military aid of America. I mean, like that, 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 because the thing is, I don't know, I mean, I, I really want to come here and say like, all right guys, how do you want to finish us? How do you want to come in the Middle East? I mean, is it just like you want to just go and, and, and intervene? Because I'm, I'm living in this country now, and I don't, I don't want to look for another dazillion dollars of military expenditure. Now I'm talking about as resident here, you know, I mean, all right, you know what? Screw the whole people back there. I don't care. But seriously, how, how much longer do you want to go in and invade countries? I mean, is this the way? I mean, you want to go now and invade Iran? You want to put sanctions forever? I mean, I don't understand. How, how, how does it work, people? Because it certainly didn't work before. It didn't work in Vietnam. It didn't work for the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. It didn't work in Iraq. When, when does it work? It doesn't. It doesn't work by invading other people's country. And then, and then remembering eight years later, oh, Obama created a vacuum by withdrawing Americans. You do not like look at the core of the problem. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little bit emotional. This is what we do in Middle East. Okay, just like, okay. Um, Malcolm, you can have a word, but, but we're gonna take questions from this microphone here. So if you'd like to ask a question, if you come up to the microphone, Malcolm, you go one minute and then okay. we're gonna- I'll, I'll make it quick, which is amazing. <laughs> um, first off, you know, David, God bless you, uh, but we have this saying in the military, all right, when we run into uh, people that don't know what they're talking about, and it's, <laughs> and it's got dead civilians. <laughs> you know, the great writer Fran Lee always had a phrase, which is, you know, uh, the woman is. <laughs> okay, thank you, the woman. Uh, the great writer Fran Lee which says, you know, think before you talk, read before you think. And let me tell you, I don't know where you're getting your data from, okay? I was on the ground, I know where the IEDs came from, I have rolled over IEDs, I have survived suicide bombings, I was st ran the statistics there. Iran is not the number one killer, it's the five million Sunni Muslims we invaded who were in Iraq. They had an entire battle force that fought us for 11 years and we withdrew because the government of Iraq told us to leave. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and they were all there. Look, man, you cannot, you know, just rhetoric your way through history and facts. We have a army... We, we, we have a thing called the Army Center for Lessons Learned, and all of these things are written down. It's called intelligence. You just can't make up stuff about Iran. It's called intelligence. Go frickin' read it. Hey. Go ahead. I, I, I would like to respond to the personal insults here. It's not an insult. Okay, in, in one minute, please. One minute. <laughs> Sorry, in one minute, David, go. Yeah, first of all, the problem here is the stacking of this panel. It's ridiculous. This is not... Oh. No, he has a point. He has a point. Let him speak, Come please. Come on. It's very, it's very easy to ridicule the, uh, you know, one person. Um, look. The reason that we don't, didn't have the 20,000 troops in Iraq is because Obama made clear he didn't want them there. Look, yeah. that's the reason. Uh, Al-Qaeda was defeated in Iraq. They were not. They, they were, were not. I was on the ground. They were active. We left them active. We were asked to leave by the government of Iraq. Do not bring that up because you need to go read okay. the Army okay. Center for okay. Lessons There is some Lord. truth. The, <laughs> no, it's wrong. Malcolm, Malcolm, the activity of Al-Qaeda had gone down substantially after the surge. That's a fact. I had I was the there numbers too. Okay. on them. Okay. 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 I wrote a whole book on it. Okay. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> Sir. Oh. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I have a book, too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm a, a Coptic Orthodox Christian from Egypt. So, uh, and I'm sure you've all heard about the recent bombings, almost monthly in all the churches in Egypt and basically across the whole Middle East in the region. I, my question is, does this panel believe that the hatred of Judaism and Christianity in the Middle East contributes to the mess in the Middle East? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. that, 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 that you need to stay closer to the microphone. We can't does hear. the hatred? The hatred against Christians and stay Judaism the in the Middle East, does yeah. that contribute to Absolutely. the mess in there the Middle East? There is like hatred against other Muslims too. I mean, those people who bomb the churches, those people who commit acts of violence against Christians, they would actually like not think twice before like committing acts of violence against secular people, against other Muslims who do not approve of this. I mean, there's a lot of people 
I mean, you have the terrorism that's happening in Egypt now. It's perpetrated, again, by ideology that we have extensively talked about. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's also perpetrated because you don't have freedom of speech or, or secularism. So, of course, there is a lot of hate against Christians, against atheists, against Shia. And if you follow closely the broadcast of the Saudi television, one actually Sheikh Leib came out two weeks ago and he said, like, we need to take a break from cursing the Christians and the Jews in order to curse the Shia. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a break. So we, they need to focus our prayers to Allah in order to destroy the Shia. You are talking about the Sikh ideology. And this ideology, again, was not born yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was born, it was nurtured over years. Think about Westboro Baptist Church, give them weapons, oil, and a whole country of their own. And then let, let us think about like, what they're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. It's 57. Stay close to the microphone. Okay. So, um, okay. So, last month in June, the Iraqi Kurdistan announced that they were going to hold a referendum in September on independence. What is, asking the entire panel, what is your opinion on how this may add a wrench, adding another independent nation or adding a whole another, a whole another issue to an, with a nation that has significant populations living in three other countries that are of opposing ideologies, viewpoints, especially since several leaders in the West have come out that they support right. the Iraqi Kurds it's a good in question. their attempt at self determination Who wants to talk about the Kurds? They have a referendum in September. Jen, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, Future of the Kurds. Yeah, look, I think uh, when I was a spokesperson in the State Department, we always said a unified Iraq is the best Iraq. That was always the United States position. That was probably pretty naive and wasn't acknowledging what was happening in on the ground. And the reality is this goes back to something that a lot of people have mentioned on this panel. We have a certain belief system in the United States, many of us, even people who are engaged in the national security community, about how government should be and how governing should be, that it should always be centralized, because that's how it is in the United States. When in reality, as you know, that's not how it is as many, many countries in, uh, in the Middle East. I mean, you could go back to, I know we have not much time, but like post-World War I on this, on this particular issue, right? So I would say, there was an inevitability to it. If you go back, look, Joe Biden was proposing a, you know, a three-partitioned Iraq. At the time, people thought he was nuts. Obviously, the Kurds have um, been a very powerful actor as it relates to fighting ISIL, and they've differentiated themselves in that way. Um, so as an as a average person, um, I think it, it, it could be for the best and could be even smart for them to be uh, their own. And obviously, it's been building there for quite some time. Okay, thank you. Sir. Uh, hello, my name is Logan, and uh, my father served 24 years in the United States Marine Corps, and I have a, tre a tremendous respect for Mr. Nance. Uh, I, I loved your, uh, your book about ISIS. It was very, um, it had a lot of uh, important pieces for people to understand. But my question um, is kind of in regards to Trump's proposed uh, Muslim ban that's been denied, uh, I think, like maybe three to four times now, I'm not too sure. But the there, there's a few things I'm kind of confused about the proposal itself. It's kind of with the logistics pieces involved because it doesn't, it doesn't have all of them. So, and also in a sense of, I believe it will be counterproductive because it only, cons it only you know, has a few Muslim majority nations and not, it does not include Saudi Arabia. So my question is like, I guess you couldn't be able to see if somebody from like Yemen or let's say Iran just flew to France and then flew to the United States, I feel like it would kind of keep the, uh, the peaceful Muslims out of the United States, but only would kind of, you know, keep, you know, it's not solving the problem basically is what my opinion is. So would, is, is it realistic to see maybe a, put the United States on maybe a some sort of like a lockdown from all travel, like talking private travel? Is that a realistic proposal besides like excluding business and like federal travel, talking private travel. Is that realistic? And if not, what would be a better proposal uh, instead of Muslim ban to keep the, the homeland safe basically? Yeah, it's, it's highly unrealistic. We can't stop the world, mm -hmm. right? And we can't, uh, is that one? <laughs> we can't stop the world. We can't keep everybody away from this nation. And when you start off by saying something like the words Muslim ban, okay, 
That's like saying the Constitution means nothing to us. Every person in this room, unless you're a Native American or an African American, because we were hostages, you are all immigrants, right? You've all come to this nation. At some time, there was uh, a, a period where other people didn't want you in here. The greatest Syrian migration was not the 10,000 people who were waiting here now. It's the ones who came here in the 1880s, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of them, and populated Pennsylvania, Ohio, and gave us Danny Thomas. So these are things that we need to understand is that we can choose to compromise everything America stands for and everything that I have defended you for, or we can find out some way that we take the word Muslim out. Terrorist ban, great. Color neutral, gender neutral, age neutral. That's the way the Israelis do it, okay? They don't trust nobody. <laughs> and then they work you through. But we were doing just fine up until Donald Trump decided to open his mouth. All right? All right, thank you. Well, since this is a Middle East um, panel and we have five minutes, I'd like to ask a simple question. Uh, there are no Israeli simple Palestinian peace. Ooh. Thank you. Um, a simple what one. Is, yes, I, I'm being Jared facetious. Kushner, thank you. What is the. <laughs> He's probably wrapping what, it up. What is the possibility? of there being a two-state solution, and what hate has to happen for that to even be viable? Anyone want to take that? I, I can Jen? start. Um, two-state solution? Sure. Uh, easy question, obviously. <laughs> um, you know, I was working in the State Department for John Kerry when we went at the Middle East peace process last time prior to Jared Kushner's effort currently, I guess, that's ongoing. Um, and I will say it's like the golden ring that every American president and every secretary of state wants. And what we discovered through the process, which I think a lot of people who've worked on these issues and probably experts in the, in the region would, would have already known, is that it's tough to find a way to a two-state solution while Netanyahu is still the prime minister. And that is because I know that is a, perhaps a controversial thing to say, but here's the reason why. Um, he is... Uh, somebody who's concerned about his own politics. There are many people in the United States like that as well. He is, in a sense, the mayor of Jerusalem. He's not somebody who has shown himself to be willing to make tough choices and to put his political uh, future on the line. It is not that the other side is faultless either. There is a problem with leadership on the Palestinian side as well. But I think that is a core problem. Every American president will chase this. Whether or not the United States should be the ones arb be as the arbiters is a is a larger question as well. And I would David, say Mr. Horowitz will probably say I'm about to ask a two state solution. Let him let him speak for himself. Okay. David, two state solution yes or no. Negotiate peace with people who want to kill you. That's what I knew. The you regimes in the, on the West Bank and in Gaza are terrorist regimes who want to ex destroy Israel, and liberate uh, Palestine, what they call Palestine, a completely invented people. Uh, from the so the 1.7 million people in Gaza Strip, they're all terrorists? People who are bombed every single 99, day? 100% of Palestinians vote for two terrorist parties. 99%? Are you sure? Did, <laughs> did Jesus visit those imaginary people, the Philistines? <laughs> the, problem in the, in, uh, the problem of the Israel-Arab conflict is a 70-year unprovoked aggression to undo the UN uh, solution. Israel doesn't occupy an ounce. Uh, Good. An so inch. let's go back to 1947 uh, borders then. Having five people. Let's go 1947. That's the first UN solution. Sitting on a panel and being interrupted too. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, <laughs> seven year aggression. Uh, Israel doesn't occupy an inch of Arab territory. It was built. It was created. Ha ha. It's created. You're just <laughs> ignorant. <laughs> you know, just, okay. What about Golan? Isn't that an Arab territory? Golan from you know Syria. What? All right. What about? Yeah, because it's Syria. What about? What, what about? Of, so what? that's an Arab thing. Look, right? that's when an we Arab defeated country. Hitler, when we defeated Hitler because of his aggressions, we gave East yeah, Russia yeah, to the Poles. That is disputable. Gentlemen, we're that not going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian yeah, right. <laughs> problem here. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we got your position. Let's move on. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your question. Sir in the red hat. The Come and give us a question. Thank you. This is. There's a reason why they do this in Camp David, away from the hearing of everyone else. <laughs> 
Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. My name is Jesse and I'm the Vice Chairman of the Graduate and Law Student Government at the University of San Diego. I also study international law. Um, I wanted to ask about this um, narrative that some of you on the panel are proposing that, you know, there's just some, you know, microscopic minority of some cultish variant of Islam because that goes very contrary to what I've studied and also heard from many people that I've met from the Middle East who say my university teach there as well. And so one of the things, for instance, I'd like to um, pose here, because I go through all kinds of statistics, but for the sake of time, we'll just keep to one. Um, Pew Research in 2013 published results showing that Egypt, Jordan, the Palestinian territories, and some others in the MENA region had an average of over 80% who agreed with the death penalty for leaving Islam. And similar percentages are encountered too with the application of Sharia law and what have you. And I just don't understand why you know the left is partnering with Islam when Islam is is supporting these kind of policies which run contrary to our Western values, okay. contrary to our Judeo-Christian values, okay. and do not support minorities. Yeah, well, this is a great question, but like I would like to imagine this exact research happening 1950s and 60s, if you look at the pictures from our countries, 1950s, hijab was something like, is not even there. So the thing is, what happened, I agree with you, there is a disease, there is a virus, or so the interpretation of Islam. And the problem is, it's not just the scripture, because the scripture has been there for 1400 years. If you look at the Bible and the Old Testament, there's like horrible stuff there. But what happened was that the Christian communities has evolved beyond the scripture. And they had their own modern interpretation of that. The problem with our, with our religion, our other area, is not scripture as much of a like society is evolving. Now, if you take the same pure research, and you make it here in America, who are living under a more secular society, 57% of uh, Muslims believe there is more than one interpretation of Islam. Muslim women are more likely to be have high, uh, uh, to have like a master's degree and work in uh, in professional jobs than Muslim men. So it's just like a, the matter of like changing the environment. I agree with you. It doesn't look well right now, but it is not because of the. Any, and I think, and I'm sorry to offend everybody, every religion to its core have a lot of problems in it. And it's the problem is whatever, and, and, the, and, what, and the problem is whatever interpretation is allowed to prevail. And then to add, to, to get back to my friend from Coptic Egypt, there are Christians in Egypt who are being evicted from their own villages, and they're evicting under the eyes and the nose of a military dictatorship, but under the police who are allowing this to happen because their interpretation of the religion is corrupt. So, the, so yes, I agree with you. I agree with all the numbers that you have said. And again, my problem with this is you have to come back and it's, it's a fight for freedom of expression and secularism, more than anything. Let me, let me finish. Wait, wait, we're done now, sorry. Yeah, and the reform has to come with, from within, which is hindered by the same dictatorship that is supported by many Western administrations. No, I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Um, all I can say is, Bassam, I hope that your son, born yesterday, grows up in a more peaceful Middle East. He's my anchor baby. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, thank you to everyone, thank you to everyone else on the panel. Thank you. Malcolm, Jen, Tommy, David, no. and Halle. Thank you all. That's it. Tomorrow night in primetime, a panel of judges.